When we um, got the uh, trial ready uh, several years ago at the time, uh, the standard of practice was still using uh, warfarin after a period of parenteral anticoagulation. Um, at that time, I think there was a lot more hesitancy in using DOACs, even though their safety and efficacy had been demonstrated in other types of venous thromboembolism. But I think people were still feeling very shy because of the lack of evidence specifically in cerebral venous thrombosis and concerns about intracranial hemorrhage because about 40% of patients with CBT have some degree of bleeding on their initial scans. Um, so when we were developing the trial, uh, our, our goal was to see if there was acceptable safety for use of uh, DOAX uh, prior to conducting a uh, fully powered clinical trial comparing the standard against warfarin. Um, that shifted over time. The guidelines have not yet um, uh, changed to reflect uh, the small studies that have demonstrated acceptable safety for, for DOAX in um, lower risk populations. Um, but I think those guideline updates are coming from the AHA, from the European uh, 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 stroke organization and also from uh, the Canadian Stroke Consortium. Uh, all of us are, are developing guidelines, and I suspect some comments about DOACs will, will be there in the future. Um, but the uh, published standard of practice remains uh, uh, vitamin K antagonists. So um, the the other thing I would say is that, you know, with these other studies uh, and ours that have um, uh, come up over time, I think people have felt a lot more comfortable integrating uh, use of DOAX into their practice in many cases, uh, even though there uh, remain no uh, fully powered uh, comparative trials. So, so secret was a feasibility trial. Cerebral venous thrombosis is a rare cause of stroke. And um, what we were trying to do, I think, is determine the, the best foundation to conduct um, the most um, efficient and meaningful trial uh, in the future about treatments for cerebral venous thrombosis. So we had a couple of specific uh, objectives. Um, one is that we wanted to get a sense of what recruitment targets were going to be like, not just because cerebral venous thrombosis is a rare disease, um, but also because not all patients would be able to um, uh, qualify for the trial uh, given particular inclusion and exclusion criteria, including contraindications to DOACs like being pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, and also just because we know that not everybody who's a candidate for a clinical trial would like to give informed consent. So um, we had the randomized trial and we also had a parallel registry through which we could continue to um, uh, prospectively collect data. The second thing we wanted to do is uh, do a pilot safety trial, looking for any signals that would suggest that DOAX were unacceptably safe for uh, further testing in, in uh, fully randomized, uh, fully powered randomized trials. And um, the third thing we wanted to do is to look at alternative um, considerations for outcomes that would be meaningful to patients and would be more common endpoints to consider for future trials for cerebral venous thrombosis. As, as a rare disease, you're going to have uh, smaller numbers to begin with and um, conventional endpoints that uh, would you would usually find in an anticoagulation trial like major bleeding or uh, recurrence of venous thromboembolism in this patient population uh, tend to be rare. So we were also looking at endpoints that are commonly experienced, things like headache or mood or fatigue and things like that, um, that might be acceptable to include as outcomes for future trials to power trials in the future. So we were able to uh, recruit our target of over 50 patients for the feasibility trial. We needed to engage several sites across Canada. We had 12 sites that recruited on average two patients per site per year um, for a total of uh, 21 patients per year between 2019 and 2021. Um, we found that uh, overall, the rate of bleeding in the uh, standard of care arm, so mostly patients on warfarin, uh, with a few patients that remained on low molecular weight heparin throughout the uh, trial, um, that the bleeding rates were actually lower than expected. We had no bleeding uh, within the, um, or, or uh, recurrent venous thromboembolism or, uh, uh, or death. Um, or a, a major extracranial hemorrhage within the first 180 days in the standard of care group. In the rivaroxaban group, we had one uh, major intracranial bleed, a spontaneous subdural after about four months of therapy, and two clinically relevant non-major bleeding events, both related to gynecological bleeding. 
Um, on extended follow-up between day 180 and day 365, we had one additional um, major hemorrhage in the patients uh, in the uh, warfarin group. Um, and that uh, the one patient that experienced that endpoint later died. Um, so overall, the rates of serious events were low overall, um, but there were numerically more bleeding events, uh, particularly within that first 180 days in the warfare in, in the uh, River Oxaban group. Still, those rates of bleeding were not out of uh, keeping with what had been seen in previous studies of DOEX for CBT. So the secondary outcomes uh, with respect to patient-centered uh, prognosis, um, we found that most patients were actually fun, uh, functionally independent, even at baseline. So, you know, as a conventional outcome, that's not a very good starting place to uh, uh, begin with if you're going to look at change over time. Um, what we did find is that people had really impaired uh, quality of life, low mood, fatigue, uh, poor cognitive performance at baseline in, in both groups. Um, but what was very encouraging is that we saw substantial improvements over time, uh, even as early as the six-month mark, and then with further incremental gains up until the 12-month point.